The Fermi Paradox, Part 15, A Galaxy of Planets. No other scientific endeavor has offered us a greater chance of locating intelligent life, of cracking the Drake Equation and resolving the Fermi Paradox, than the race to find extrasolar planets. Since they were first identified in the 1990s, the pace of their discovery has been dizzying. From dozens 20 years ago, to hundreds a decade ago, to thousands now. And in decades to come, as telescopes increase in power and our techniques refine, we will almost certainly detect ever smaller and more Earth-like variations, and perhaps even spy the first glimmer of extrasolar life, and yes, even civilization. If you were born after 1992, you have lived your entire life aware of the existence of planets circling other stars. For someone alive before then, this could appear mildly remarkable. That our solar system is not unique may, in hindsight, seem commonsensical, even mundane. But for centuries, it was merely speculation, fodder for philosophers and science fiction writers. In the late 16th century, the Dominican friar Giordano Bruno argued that, quote, there are countless suns and countless earths all rotating around their suns in exactly the same way as the seven planets of our system. We only see the suns because they are the largest bodies and are luminous, but their planets remain invisible to us because they are smaller and non-luminous. The countless worlds in the universe are no worse and no less inhabited than our earth." Unquote. Popular science often says he was burned at the stake for that belief, but then he also said Jesus wasn't divine and that Mary wasn't a virgin, so it really wasn't required. This vision of the universe would eventually be given mathematical structure by Isaac Newton, and colored with fantastic vistas and wondrous monsters by writers as diverse as Voltaire, H.P. Lovecraft, and George Lucas. A galaxy teeming with planets was not merely the reserve of rollicking space operas. Scientists, too, accepted it as true, even without confirmation. By the 1980s, the nebular hypothesis, the idea that planetary systems coalesced from spinning disks of gas around young stars, was generally recognized as the correct model for planet formation. Discoveries such as the debris disk found around the young star Beta Pictoris in 1983 helped confirm the model's predictions. If, as evidence suggested, the hypothesis was correct, then planets were an intrinsic product of star formation and would be possessed by any star of sufficient age for them to form. But it would be nearly a decade and many false starts before the first indisputable evidence of their existence came to light. A particularly harsh and deathly light. The story behind the discovery of the first extrasolar planets intersects with ours in an unexpected way. In 1967, Jocelyn Bell, a graduate student at Cambridge, identified a radio source in the constellation of Vulpecula that cycled regularly every 1.3 seconds. At first, this regularity appeared artificial, perhaps the first evidence of extraterrestrial intelligence. She even went as far as to name her new signal LGM-1, for Little Green Men. After she found another, very similar signal, however, she decided it was natural. One civilization sending Earth a message was conceivable. Two doing so at exactly the same time was not. It was later determined that what Bell had found was a rapidly rotating body with narrow beams of energy erupting from its poles, not unlike the beam from a lighthouse. Every time a beam crosses our line of sight, we see it as a pulse, hence their modern name, pulsars. Pulsars are believed to be a form of neutron star, the dead remnant of a giant star that has exploded in a supernova. These objects are heavier than our sun, but crushed into a diameter smaller than Manhattan Island. They are so dense that a matchbox of their matter would weigh five trillion tons, and of such immense gravity that a mountain on their surface would be just five millimeters tall. Their powerful magnetic fields and erupting beams of energy suffuse their environments with deadly radiation. In short, there are a few places in the universe one would less expect to be the first to find planets in. And yet, in 1992, to the profound shock of pretty much everyone, astronomer Alex Wolstan would turn expectations on their head. 
Fleeing communist Poland for Puerto Rico in the 1980s, Volstan gained access to the island's Arecibo radio telescope, the largest single-dish radio telescope in the world, to search for pulsars. One such pulsar, romantically titled PSR B157 plus 12, was located 1,300 light-years away in the constellation of Virgo. But the pulsar was, in Volstan's words, cantankerous. No matter what he did, he couldn't match the timing of its pulses to his own predictions. One possible explanation, which Volstan initially didn't accept, was that a planet was orbiting the pulsar along his line of sight, periodically blocking the beam. The more deeply he gazed at the pulsar, the more complex the variations became, until he began to suspect there were not one, but two, and eventually three planets circling it. With the new planets added to his calculations, the results matched predictions perfectly. It seemed incontrovertible that the pulsar had somehow gained a system of planets. But how? How could a dead star that had long ago blown whatever planets it had once had into space have somehow conjured a new set from the ether? The answer proved surprisingly simple. This particular pulsar was a type known as a millisecond pulsar, which means it spins so rapidly that its pulses are measured in milliseconds. But pulsars slow down as they age, and only spin so rapidly for a tiny fraction of their lives. For millisecond pulsars to be as common as they are, something must be speeding them up again. If the pulsar originally had a stellar companion that had since been destroyed, it could have received more spin energy as the material from its companion fell onto it. Whatever material remained would coalesce into a new planetary system. The first extrasolar planets ever found have been somewhat ill-served by history, with many accounts of planetary discovery tending to ignore them. Unsurprisingly, this ghoulish retinue of undead planets bathed in the hellish glare of a star's corpse did not capture the imagination of a humanity hungry for the lush, vibrant worlds of pulp fantasy. But when, for the first time, a planet was found around a star like our own, it would offer its own vision of hell and shatter any and all expectations against a wall. And we will be discussing that remarkable planet in the next episode.